Welcome to Sunday Morning Forum at the First Unitarian Society in Milwaukee. Um, before we begin today, there uh, we have a speaker next Sunday, and that will be on the 26th at the same time, and it will be Elizabeth Pearson. She's an attorney with Law Forward, and she's going to be speaking on democracy and the Wisconsin Supreme Court, of all things. So we'll see. And now today, I'm very happy to be able to introduce our speaker for you today. And um, uh, his talk today is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly at the UN's Climate Change Conference. So he's going to share with us his experiences and all the people and all of the information that he has come home with. So today we all have, we welcome uh, Steve Watrous. I should have shared all of it. You know, it was a two-week conference. We'd be here for a while. But we went to do that. <laughs> but they can do, I, I, uh, I'm not a climate change expert. This conference was about climate change. Uh, its full name is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it's a, uh, they have elaborate names and acronyms sometimes. And it was COP27, you might say, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean much to the average person. It means conference of the parties. Well, party sounds good. Huh? Um, but it's the parties or the governments of the world. And this is the one time uh, that they all come together along with activists, along with NGOs, along with all kinds of people interested in climate change. The one time in the world where they all get, the, the, the most of them get together and um, try and make some progress, or in the case of the fossil fuel lobbyists, hold it back. That's part of the ugly. There was over 600 fossil fuel lobbyists at this thing. Altogether, there are about 40,000 people according to the United Nations. And um, it's big, it's really big. I had some trepidation about it. Would it be worthwhile? It takes a fair amount of money to go over there. It takes a bit of time. And um, Egypt, you know, has its reputation, it's a military, military dictatorship. They don't allow public demonstrations. I kind of like those. And the previous one in Glasgow, Scotland, they had all kinds of street demonstrations urging the governments of the world to do better and more and faster. Would that happen in Egypt? Well, I don't know. Um, but I was, I mean, it, it exceeded my expectations. I'll try and show why some of the good stuff. So anyway, so that's the explanation of why it's called COP27. The place with Charm El Sheikh, and I'll show you where that is. Uh, just a, a little bit more about me. I, uh, I as all of us um, do, I wear many hats. I'm president of the United Nations Association, Greater Milwaukee Chapter, and that's what I was representing at this COP27. And uh, I'm also a delegate to the Labor Council. Uh, I used to teach sociology at METC, and I worked with a group called the End the Wars Coalition. And um, we actually have an event. I mean, up on Friday, the anniversary of the horrible war starting in Ukraine, or on that later. So, um, well, let's see some pictures. <coughs> so, I don't know where Egypt is, but um, did you know that if you go north from the place where we were, the, the peninsula here, Shah and Sheikh, you would go through Ukraine and end up near Moscow. And it turns out it's, actually, it's a resort town that has conference facilities. It's used to conquer them, so well, not this big. And um, people come down from Eastern Europe to vacation in Sharma Sheikh. And a uh, very pleasant place. It's really, really hot in summer. Our thing was in November. It was so much cooler. Hello. You know, if you're out between about nine and four o'clock and walk three blocks, you can work up the sweat. So it's hot. It's a desert. Place. So you can see how deserty the whole place is, except for the Nile River and the Delta. It's pretty much all the desert. Um, we got problems with uh, water. They do have possibilities, however, for renewable energy. We're on that in a little. So that's 27. They have various uh, various zones. And so there was the green zone on one side of the main street, and then there was the the uh, permanent conference center on the other side with a whole bunch of temporary buildings. It's about the size, I would say, of the state fairgrounds out in West Dallas, uh, but without the fun food. And uh, uh, so this is the green zone, which had uh, uh, somewhat lower level security and much more outside art. 
So it's a worthwhile effort. So I gave a presentation to the 350.org group. Maybe you know there are folks that are dedicated to work on climate change. The 350 refers to how much carbon dioxide is in the uh, atmosphere to, to be relatively safe. We've exceeded that long ago, 350 uh, parts per million carbon dioxide. And uh, so it was a worthwhile. Well, there's, uh, there's like I said, the good and the bad. So here's a world-class climate change scientist, Michael Mann, who actually the United Nations Association brought here about a year and a half ago uh, to speak at our um, annual or celebration of the start of the United Nations event in October. But he had a couple other people while he was here. Um, brilliant guy, and he was there. And so he says, don't despair. It's never about a single cop. This year's summit, like every summit, fell short of what is needed. But the overall trajectory is progress. This is not the time to give up on the world's only functional framework to tackle climate change. I don't know if it's the only, but, but it's the biggest and uh, probably the most important. And so um, uh, it goes on about the, you know, the pros and cons of it. But I, I like the idea of the trajectory. It, you know, it's, it's, it's not going upward fast enough, but, um, but it's something. And so um, there's the green zone, and even the sign is green in this case. Um, so lots of art I want to show just one or two artsy things here that I think maybe set a tone for the thing. So maybe you can see it says rising tide, and there's some figures that will make sense when you see the whole row. So the, the old cliche about the rising tide raises all boats. Well, if the glaciers and the uh, ice caps are melting, it's a rising tide, but it's going to sink a bunch of boats, especially the islands of the Pacific. We're on that in a minute. So maybe you can see starting out running on the level and then you know, knee deep in the big muddy and then the waist deep. Um, here, was, it's, here was another fun way to make the points. It says, Heaven and Hell, and we have to the scene that is our, our current era. And you go in, they give you a questionnaire about lifestyle things, really hard questions. And if you don't get them all right, they send you to the hell part where it's decorated up as if it was on fire because of well, global warming turning into scorching. And um, there's one more way to, to make the point of we need to do something in fast, including lifestyle changes. So there were lots and lots of presentations going on um, in, in many venues. There are probably at least, I'd say at least 50 different things going on at any given hour. And so I didn't go to all of them, and therefore I can't tell you about all of them. But I thought I'd just show this as an example. So it says energy efficiency and um, conservation and cooperation between Egypt and Japan, risk mitigation and sustainable transportation, uh, elevating the voice of women. Um, I forget the last word is. Uh, I have a better, yeah, better angle on it. Uh, propelling the green transition. And so I wasn't sure. I thought, you know, maybe the. I go to a lot of conferences and often they have some environmental <coughs> art or maybe the whole thing's environmental. It's usually more, so we say progressive or left oriented. Um, and I thought, well, maybe this thing would be a little more staid look so that, um, that uh, thought process maybe wouldn't get a hearing. But actually, just about every voice got a hearing there. I'll show you some of that. Uh, so did I say it's a resort home? Could you face us when you talk? Yes. Sorry, um, so, uh, so this is one of the resorts. It also has conference facilities, and so I decided to see the pool. They use a lot of water, maybe not in a good way at this resort. If you turn the other way, you'd be facing the Red Sea, and people will assume in the Red Sea. And so, um, this is a uh, the uh, first demonstration I noticed. I, I had this fear that we wouldn't have the fun street demonstrations. Well, they can't be in the street because that's illegal in Egypt. But on the conference grounds where the United Nations had control of security, it was allowed. So here's some, some vegans who, um, uh, well, you can see what they had to say. Uh, they also had some tasty vegan snacks to give us to maybe influence us a little. This is still another venue. This was the, the kind of hardcore anti-fossil fuel, I would say anti-capitalist folks. And they had their own venue away from the main conference center. And so this was a, a case where we went down a very, very nice Egyptian dinner for us, good presentation, and then dance. And this is the party part of it, putting the party in cop. So here's another one. This is uh, inside the so-called blue zone, the higher security zone. You have to have you have to have um, tags to get into these things. They brought a few to show you here. 
And so you have to have the right one for the right venue or else. So it says, don't gas Africa. You can't quite see it fully there, but let me say a word about that. So it was in Africa and there were African people there. You can see some of them present at this. So why are they protesting? Well, so Europe, which has a lot to do with Africa, this uh, aid and projects, development projects of various sorts have been urging them on to renewable energy and things to well help with the goals of the uh, Paris COP of, uh, of about five years ago, where they were trying to set the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius to raise their global temperature, no more than that. We're up to 1.2 at the moment and 1.5. People said, keep 1.5 alive. We heard that a lot. Worth trying, we need to try, but uh, um, don't bet on it. <laughs> anyway, so why Africa? So you heard before before about the start of the Ukraine war, European countries were helping with these projects in Africa, conservation, renewable transition, etc. But with the war and the cutoff of gas supplies and such from Russia going to Europe. All of a sudden, Europe said, we need really lots of natural gas and oil and fast. And so they started pushing the African countries to drill more and build facilities to ship natural gas from places like Senegal up to, um, up to Europe. And so one of the African folks actually said that the setback, their environmental um, progress 10 years in Africa because of things related to this Ukraine war. More on that later. So you know the Sahara Desert is kind of the northern part of Africa. Below that, it's called the Sahel, just uh, south of that. And so some things I heard people say is that the Sahel is actually warming uh, faster than the average of uh, temperatures around the world. And um, uh, and some other things, uh, Africa puts out about 3% of the greenhouse gases of the world, and yet it's suffering some of the most. Uh, poor people tend to take it on the chin with these things. So they have this terrible drought, especially in the Northeast or the Horn of Africa area. And on top of that drought and the food ramifications of that, because of the Ukraine war, not enough meat is getting down from Ukraine to Africa. A lot of that went to Africa and the Middle East. So they're suffering uh, in various ways in Africa. It's, uh, it's rather shocking and scary, really. Um, uh, but since they're sort of the least industrialized um, continent, people said, well, there's an opportunity here. Folks in Africa want to industrialize and want to have a better standard of living. Um, what if what if we found ways to fund them to do it in a green way as opposed to well the United States way of despoiling the environment on its way to development? And so there's and there, there are some good projects. There's lots of good projects going on, including in Africa, and lots of good ideas that could do even better if they had the funding. Uh, so among other things, they mentioned the problems in Africa, the, the migration of, across borders because of, well, the drought and in some cases wars, and um, uh, that they could do much better. They had financing, but they don't want to be told what to do. Uh, saying I heard was nothing about us without us. That is to sure to consult the people who are allegedly benefiting from these uh, ideas they emanating out of Europe. So let's get that here. So um, this is that same demonstration, but a little bit higher. So this is the, uh, the main conference center called the Blue Zone. And um, you, you need to, it's a little harder to get passes into that. So I've only had a pass for about half of my time there. Um, the red building at the top is where the big time conferencing was going on. That is the parties, that is the governments of the world who were meeting to well make promises that they may or may not deliver on hash out this loss and damage thing, let's say we're on that, and, um, and put out a final statement, which some people detected was a little bit soft on the fossil fuel industry, maybe because of the 600 plus lobbyists that were there. So the uh, US delegation was headed by John Kerry. We can see here, um, you know, this presidential candidate, Senator, one-time anti-war protester, and, uh, He's talking about something called the NDCs, and it's the Nationally Declared Contributions, and another funny acronym, but stands for what the governments of the world have promised to do to try and keep the global warming under that 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's a little poker up. So I got to see him a couple of times, and uh, I do want to say a little bit of what he had to say for you. And so uh, the uh, first talk, the one about the financing. 
He says, uh, if we're going to win on climate change, and we must win, here's some things that have to happen. He says, every country wants to do more that lacks the wherewithal. And uh, this uh, presentation I heard from him was after President Biden had come down on the Friday of the two week conference, the first Friday. He would um, pledge one to, uh, 12 billion for a particular project that Harry wanted to talk about. He um, uh, also talked about USAID, uh, USAID, the Agency for International Development, which has a checkered past, one might say, and uh, mentioned that another big meeting was coming up in April to some, advance some of these ideas. At another talk, which was at the US Pavilion, uh, many countries of the world had a pavilion, some larger, some smaller, lots and lots of NGOs, or what they call them nowadays, civil society organizations, or CSOs. And so at the second one, he was talking about ocean things. And so he says 50% of the oxygen that we have comes from the oceans. And 90% of the heat that we've created has been absorbed by the oceans, which is a process that can't continue really. It's added to higher acidity uh, than ever before. And it, uh, therefore the oceans are threatened with not being able to produce the fish and other things that we like to eat. And uh, you lamented the fact that we still don't have an ocean treaty needed to protect the oceans. Uh, you mentioned that shipping is the eighth largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And uh, the good part is, is that some things are happening with that. And that is, there's a company called Maersk, a Danish company that's really big on global shipping. And he says uh, they have committed to eight ships that will be carbon free. That's encouraging. These, these ships are really dirty uh, polluters. Uh, they run on a fuel called bunker, which in addition to the carbon dioxide puts out uh, particulates and other things. And uh, Kerry said that there were another 19 such ships that were on order from other companies. And that Norway in particular has taken up the green shipping challenge in cooperation with the United States. Uh, so that was all encouraging. And um, we talked about some other things that the US is doing with an ocean aspect that the US had, uh, developed 30 gigabytes, was developing 30 gigabytes by 2030 on offshore wind generators. And furthermore, the US is going to protect 30% of the US waters by 2030. And so, all good things, not enough. Uh, in one workshop, somebody said, um, you know, consider this analogy consider a school bus going down the road. You know how sometimes dogs chase after vehicles? He says, uh, suppose the, uh, uh, the school bus is the uh, climate crisis heading for the cliff, and the dog is us, the environmentalists, chasing after it. He says, the good thing is that the dog is going faster and faster. And this environment is are doing more and more. Public consciousness is getting better and better. But the bus is also accelerating. And he says, unless that uh, dog does something drastically different, it's never going to catch the bus. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of doom and gloom, frankly, and cautious optimism was about the best you could get. So this is not my photo. This is inside the inner sanctum where you have the entire security. This is where the the, uh, well, the parties, the governments, and their rather large staffs that they brought along have these meetings to hash out things in working groups and such. And so that's in a, that, that red building that I showed earlier. So you might wonder who else is on the delegation. So it mentions John Kerry and a bunch of other people. I don't know that they were all there for the whole time. Anthony Blinken, you know, the Secretary of State, Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy the head of the U.S. Agency for National Development, the Environmental Protection Agency, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Secretary of Agriculture, pretty high level. I don't know if President Trump sent uh, to these things when he was in charge, but this, this strikes me as taking it seriously. So, um, so President Biden came down and did a curious speech. Um, I did read it afterwards. All these things are available by the owners of online, et cetera, whatever. But I uh, took out one little statement from him. He says, I'm, I'm pleased to announce today, alongside the European Union and Germany, a 500 million package to finance and facilitate Egypt's transition to clean energy. This package will enable Egypt to deploy 10 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030, or bringing offline five gigawatts of inefficient gas powered facilities, reducing emissions in Egypt and the power sector by 10%. So that's encouraging. Um, they, they've got lots of room for renewable energy in Egypt, I have to say. 
Um, so here's one thing you wouldn't get just by reading the newspaper accounts of it. It says COP27 Indigenous Peoples Caucus Caucus and their agenda. So I went to one of their sessions. And so there was space made for you know, these folks that were not quite mainstream. And so we can see a couple of things there, but the one I call, when I call your attention to is this one here, the last and damage. It says constituencies are proposing language, including indigenous representation on the advisory body and so on and so on. So uh, looking back on COP27, people were saying, well, the, the biggest breakthrough was this loss and damage. The poor countries, the underdeveloped countries, the, the Pacific sinking countries of the world uh, were wanting to get this going, which meant, well, we're distributing some money from the rich countries to the poor, and they wanted to get it going. Well, right now, uh, the United States was, um, was urging to go slow on this. We need to do more research, uh, figure out how best to spend these monies, which there aren't any up yet, but will be hopefully someday. Uh, but the poor countries won out. They, they uh, got this thing passed funded yet that's bumped off to the next stop, which would be this December, also in that kind of hot part of the world in the United Arab Emirates. There's controversy over that too. Um, this is uh, still in the blue zone, the Climate Justice Pavilion, and uh, heard a couple of interesting presentations there. This one was by the NAACP of the US, which actually announced a breakthrough. They've been working on the uh, Jackson, Mississippi water problem, and they managed to get the EPA to declare this was just announced a breakthrough news that the, uh, um, the EPA of the US was going to launch a civil rights complaint against the government of the state of Mississippi about how they were mistreating Jackson in regards to water. Uh, indigenous women, um, often in uh, native outfits, uh, were there. And, uh, you know, I brought a suit and tie along to this thing, but uh, after the first day, I realized that a lot of people weren't wearing that. Uh, most, mostly white men, not even all of them were wearing those, but a lot of people had much more interesting dress. Uh, another thing for women, leading the charge, women in the climate crisis. And so this is the uh, training booth, and I actually went to two presentations there because, well, among other things, I'm working on the, uh, you know, the Ukraine war, trying to do what little we can to make some impact on that. But I uh, would like to uh, read a couple of things that I found out there about the Ukraine. They had, a, they had an environmental aspect to it. I mean, the, the war is horrible in many ways. And when the people actually said that the, uh, the environment is always a victim of war, but they actually had the environmental minister there who's, who's speaking and some other, some other folks. So let me mention just a couple of things of, that you may not have thought of. Um, he says half of the world's imported food comes from Ukraine. This has all been disrupted by the war. Uh, their wetlands are being wrecked by well tanks and things running through various parts of the country. Uh, it says the environmental damage will uh, take generations to overcome. Um, they, have, they have chemical and pesticide uh, industries there, which have been bombed, which means some of these horrible chemicals have gotten loose into the environment, into the waterway, into the air. Uh, once they're loosening the environment, there's a lot of hard work being up and they're in the factory, of course. Uh, what about waste management? Well, that's, that's fallen apart too. And so what do people do with their garbage? To the streets, to the back alleys, to the rivers. Um, there's unexploded ordnance uh, all over the place. They say they're the most uh, landmine country in the world at this point. They even had a figure of 799 and some thousand that is almost 800,000 uh, explosive devices were somehow hidden around the country, sometimes hidden, sometimes uh, obvious, but some of them are actually farmlands, which is going to make it hard to farm uh, if it's where it gets uh, finished. Um, uh, the water and sewer treatment systems have been completely disrupted. They said that the uh, last, last year, that 33 million tons of carbon dioxide had been uh, released into the atmosphere, and that this was, uh, this was three times more than the previous year. That is, the war caused a huge jump in emissions of greenhouse gases. Where does this come from? Well, fires, lots of fires, forest fires, fires from explosions, uh, oil depots, uh, storage areas have been blown up and, and set on fire. And um, well, just a little bit more. Well, actually, I can show you a little bit more. Let's see. 
So they uh, sent the direct damage. This was in mid November. Um, it's gotten worse since then. Direct damage 90, uh, 97 billion. Uh, what they pledged to do is save the construction of buildings and infrastructure to modern and green standards when the war ends. And they had a whole bunch of green ideas to do it right. They figured they would need 349 billion, which again as of November. So here's some impact on the flora and fauna. The excessive pollution of water bodies can kill hundreds of fish. We've had this already, including dolphins. The explosions, the uh, vibrations are disrupting the uh, animals. The shell burst, forest fires led to the death of wild animals. We have something called the, the emerald embrace, um, and that is the green areas, protected green areas, and that these uh, some have been destroyed by the war, and that they actually had 600 species that were endangered, many of them in these. Um, Emerald areas, and uh, those those are all in danger. Uh, here's a couple of more instances. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here's one that might jump out at you. Cadavers of mice due to mass deaths of animals and humans. And they said that some of them were not buried or not buried very deep, and that it was really an epidemiological nightmare with well decaying bodies putting up germs into the environment. Uh, this was uh, uh, another uh, presentation I went there where they had sort of the wider ranging aspects of the Ukraine war. And so they have two people from Africa, one from Latin America, and a woman in the center is uh, from Ukraine. Um, it's, uh, it's impacting really lots of parts of the world. Um, on to more positive things, smart school food solutions. This is from uh, Brazil. There are lots of good ideas there. So here's one of them. Got some data there about people being affected by hunger globally, and that the food waste from well, food you know goes to landfills and such is responsible for ten percent of greenhouse gas emissions. That's a lot, ten percent. And so here in Brazil, they had a program to work on that and with more money. It could be you know, done in other parts of the world. I was encouraged by that. And while we're on school things, uh, they talked about school buses. Have to have school buses, right? Electric school buses, good idea, feasible. But what to do with them in summer when they're not being used much when school is out? Well, think of this. You need more electricity in summer because of air conditioning, right? And so if you have solar arrays or wind power, you need somewhere to store it because of, well, rainy days and dark nights and things. And so one of those school buses during the summer could be used as storage batteries for the renewable energy. Sounds good to me. Um, when I uh, used to show these things to students at some point, students not paying attention would say, now were you actually there? <laughs> yes, <I'm not. laughs> so uh, so other conferences I go to on political things, like I said, have environmental stuff, but this is new to me, and I guess new to COP27, venture capital investment for climate action. And so they had folks that had, well, billions of dollars that they needed to do something with to make money for the investors. And they were interested in doing it in a green sort of way. And so this is kind of new and interesting to me. And I want to give you a little bit of information from this particular session. The uh, moderator who's, who's here with the microphone said, well, suppose I gave you another um, $100 million to invest, what would you do with it? And so they had to kind of prioritize things strategically. And so I had to relate some of that to you. So one of them said, alternative proteins, that is something other than red meat for people to eat. And uh, you would put the money into infrastructure, which meant ways to ferment, somehow to ferment things into tasty alternative proteins. Another one said, well, 70 million for more sustainable cities uh, dealing with the cement concrete issue, which are big producers of greenhouse gas, by the way, and um, to do much more solar. And then the other 30 million into biodiversity in the agricultural sector. All right, so, so another one said, all of them did the food waste, dealing with food waste, like that previous one I showed. Um, another one said, well, let's decarbonize the grid, that is, put more green energy into the electrical system that we have and make it compatible. And furthermore, uh, vehicle fleets should all go electric with this, you know, more access to power from the green grid. And not even stop there, that uh, they find alternative fuels for ships, as I mentioned, and aviation. Find things with something, some kind of biofuel. Um, so another one said, well, this one had a market basket of things. 
20 million for education so that young people could understand what's going on and hopefully do better than we did in the future. 20 million for infrastructure, that green grid. Uh, 20 million for policy lobbying to constrain the corporations. Uh, another 20 million for ad adaptation things. They so talk about adaptation and mitigation a lot at this conference. And uh, the last 20 million for venture funds for breakthrough technology. Now, they all had cautions. They said venture capitalists are not going to save the world from climate change. Um, and nor is technology going to do it. But it's all, as I said, one, one more bite out of the apple. Um, they can do something that makes money too for people uh, or power to money. So, um, uh, they did say one interesting more thing that I want to relate to you. And they, um, it, you know, they're talking about oil companies and a lot of criticism of them, including this huge influx of lobbyists, which were like 30% more than the previous COP that is in Glasgow. Someone said, well, the 12 largest oil companies had uh, put together some money into their own venture capital fund and they were putting into um, operations outside of fossil fuels, including food issues. And um, uh, that sounded kind of encouraging that they're using some of their massive profits for a good cause on the side. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's something. Uh, let's turn the camera sideways at the same event. I mean, maybe you can see some of the diversity of people there, some wearing masks, some not, some with head coverings, some not. In the uh, back, maybe you can see these kind of boxy things. Those are like industrial strength air conditioners, which they had to run all day and all night to keep the place cool. And uh, it's basically a glorified uh, circus tent. They have a lot of temporary structures set up for this thing. So um, this is a uh, discussion about the South Pacific Islands. This woman is Kiribati, and they're really in big time danger. A lot of our low lying islands. Um, there's talk about uh, planting more mangroves around them to kind of stop the uh, the waves, the high water, the high tides from getting into the island. Uh, and that that would be considered um, mitigation. Uh, adaptation is a more long-lasting thing, you know, like moving to higher ground in some of the Pacific Island nations have formed friendly other islands where they've been able to move to and buy land and continue their culture and way of life. Um, these are the island nations in the South Pacific, and uh, up in the corner is Hawaii, it's the Orange, and so Kiribati, I mentioned, is in the middle. And, uh, I was with a guy, another person from the United Nations Association, but in Hawaii, and we were kind of roommates, and he's been to these things and moved his way around to a bunch of these people because all these on the island have been interested in islands. And so um, so we got to meet some great people that way. Oh, at Microsoft, lots and lots of booths, lots of booths around this thing. And so um, so I uh, sat down there having a presentation, and I sat down to see what they had to say. They're talking about coal-fired power plants, and I thought, what? Is this really true that I'm in the wrong place? But here's the thing. He says there's 2,400 uh, coal-fired power plants are not going away tomorrow. Is there a way we can make them less polluting in the meantime while we're doing the transition to renewable? Well, plausible. I guess it's a cost-benefit thing, but uh, they can do that in a cheaper way and, well, more power to them. Uh, how about nuclear for climate? Lots and lots of boots. Uh, sustaining, sustaining all life in the background there, which is a very different nature. It's for uh, reevaluation counseling or for counseling. Uh, the thing was put on by the UN. The UN has many branches. You know, I'm the president of the local chapter. I can't even name all the branches in the United Nations. But here are some of them. This one is uh, dealing with uh, women who are suffering from the well, terrible climate change, uh, catastrophic floods in Pakistan uh, late last year. Um, then I mentioned mangrove projects. The ladder, the, uh, the rotary, which maybe some of you remember of, um, the downtown one meets at the art center fairly often, has great speakers. Um, and so they were talking about some of their projects. And um, they're trying to get all the rotaries of the world to work together on well environmental sustainable development. And it turns out they had a big project in Egypt that they uh, showed some pictures of. They had discovered an aquifer somewhere out in the desert of Egypt and had drilled down to it and created a new oasis, which could well grow food, which well, Egypt desperately needs because they don't have that much arable land. And uh, they, they were getting a lot of uh, grain from Ukraine, which isn't there anymore. Um, 
This is from Nigeria, displays of things they're doing. You know, every country in the world is doing something, and they put their best foot forward at this conference. They had glossy brochures, which I picked up and should show you if you want. But, um, and they uh, almost all were doing presentations many times during this two week conference. When President Biden came down, a bunch of Congress people came with him. And so here are some of them in the uh, natural, in the uh, history museum in Sharma Sheikh. Nobody from Wisconsin, alas. Uh, you get to chat with them a little bit. And there was a dinner event afterwards, a nice free dinner. And I sat down with someone who was actually um, uh, a top aide to Pete Buttigieg in the Department of Transportation. And so uh, I had a nice chat with her. Great place to meet people. I, I like doing that. <laughs> Uh, this was the U.S. Pavilion when they had this huge display from NOAA, or, and put it together by NASA actually, and they had various pollution types. You can see across the bottom, carbon, sulfite, uh, salt, etc. This is actually a moving picture. It was on a loop, and you can see where they were generated, and then how they moved all around the world. Psychedelic, mesmerizing, scary. Uh, the world is well more connected than ever. The World Health Organization was there with this fancy tree sculpture. And uh, this is back in the green zone where at night it sort of has this magical look. You can maybe see in the back side, there's some, uh, some of their solar, um, photovoltaic solar arrays. And this was a panda. They said made of all, all entirely recycled stuff. And um, it's fun to look at. And so uh, this is the Indigenous Peoples Pavilion. And just you can see kind of the crowds there. In this particular place, you can see people with colorful headdresses and uh, wonderful outfits. And, uh, and then I uh, went over to the other side and saw the wonders of ancient Egypt. So let me show you a couple more things and then I'll have to offer questions. <coughs> Well, for one, if this isn't enough for you, I do have a Shepherd article in the current issue, Jan, February issue. And um, <coughs> there might be still some around. The, uh, I used to write a lot for the Shepherd um, until they sort of changed their business plan 20 years ago. But they liked it enough. They said, well, would you like to follow up on it doing something about carbon dioxide in Milwaukee? And so if anybody here knows of an interesting project or somebody with special knowledge on that, let me know. I'd like to interview them. And, it up for the uh, not the immediate upcoming, but the next one out, Shepherd. And the good ideas front. <coughs> We've all seen little uh, like potato chip bags like this, right? Uh, maybe you find the bags in your front yard after a big win. So the uh, there was one booth that was promoting these, and not so much what's in them as the the uh, package itself, which is made partly out of calcium carbonate. So usually these things are made out of plastic, which is, well, oil. You make uh, plastic resin from oil. But with the calcium carbonate, they needed less oil to make it, which seemed good. And it's not that it's more recyclable in the usual sense, but think of this, the uh, cement concrete issue, which takes, you know, you have to heat up the limestone with it, you know, very, uh, very uh, polluting. But actually you can use these, you shred them up properly and put them into the cement, uh, you have the bulk, but without losing any strength to a certain point. And so if you can capture these back, you can well, make them into your highway. And so these are hard to capture back. But, you know, when you go to a dry cleaner and your clothing, clothing comes back with these plastic wraps around them. Well, this guy actually makes those wraps um, for use, like in the fashion district of New York City. And those are recapturable and can be well turned around and used to pave roads. And so I thought that was a good idea. In, in another workshop in a different venue, but I heard that there was a way to capture carbon out of the uh, atmosphere and turn it into calcium carbonate in a certain way. I don't know if these things are gonna ever work big time or not, but, um, but they're exciting to me. That's one thing is a bunch of new ideas that I heard. So I think um, I think that's enough time I'm talking. I can record your questions, comments, controversies. If you have questions, now's the time. What edition of the check is printed? This uh, issue it, uh, should be still on the let's say bookshelves and the grocery store shelves or something. It looks like this on the front. Oh, it's current. It's current the current configuration. They're on their bill online too. 
For the Congress people, they're all Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't actually, you know, and that's a good question, and I, and I don't know the answer, and I didn't take names. Um, even if they came to the president, I guess there were more Democrats, but uh, there, there are some Republicans genuinely interested in the environment because then it could have been some. Yes. Yes, Steve, you mentioned the zero emission ship. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of power to propel a ship across the ocean. And they're making these things already. You said now they've got to be battery powered. I can't imagine battery development to this point that's that substantial to power a ship across the ocean. Uh, is it, it's it, it's daunting that they didn't give the details, and so I, I can't answer the technical yeah. questions on that. But there was some talk of this green hydrogen, and I'm guessing that they that might be what they're going to do. That green hydrogen means you take some water and cook it with electricity that comes from a solar array or from a windmill, and separate the hydrogen and oxygen. Well, then you can get a lot of power out of that hydrogen, and so on. Uh, this is just speculation, but that that might be one way they're doing it with ships. Yeah, that sounds a lot more physical than this giant junkie and anything I don't know. Yeah. Uh, good question, though. Mm -hmm. Andy. Um, you mentioned carbon extraction, and that's not the end of me because it's not only reducing carbon dioxide, it's kind of undoing previous carbon dioxide. Was there a discussion of that? Yes, as a matter of fact. Um, Let's see if I have that a lot. So, here where I got that plastic bag made out of stone. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. There was a booth that was talking about trees, and really the best thing is trees. And we've lost a lot of trees in the world. And as you've heard, the Amazon especially taking it on the chin under the previous president there. Hopefully, a change with the new president who actually came to the conference, by the way. And so um, there's a, a thing that I don't know much about. And I don't ask me to explain it, but there's a thing called carbon credits. And somehow, polluting industries can buy carbon credits, which kind of gets them off the hook from doing the proper pollution. Um, diminishment on their own operations, but if they do, you know, support some good projects somewhere else, and some of get credit. All right. So, um, so there's a program going on in a couple of countries of Africa where the farmers were paid to well grow trees, and like, they could get carbon credits, and so they would be paid to grow these trees. And there was a um, a system for um, you know every year they'd have to like take a picture with like a measuring stick to show that the tree was still there and how big it was. And send it in in order to get paid for it. And um, I hadn't thought of such a thing before. Um, they said it seemed to be working. Farmers liked it. And you know, a big thing is you know, with the adaptation, farmers in Africa or anywhere in the world, because the climate heats up, which is going to do it, it's irreversible. It's just a matter of how fast and how far. Some will need to shift to other crops or move to other areas. They like move to Wisconsin where there's more water instead of the Southwest. And so, um, uh, but to try new things for well, anybody, but particular farmers who are used to farming the same thing for decades or generations, what to do to, um, you, you don't want to say you, you must do this, you want to force it on them. But what about incentivizing them, for example, this tree idea? And one thing that I heard that was interesting to me was the idea of a safety net that for farmers or anybody to try something new, you know, it's kind of a risk uh, that might not work out. You might not like it, Some, something might go awry. So it sort of disincentivizes you to try something new. But they said, well, what if we can create a, a safety net for farmers in particular to try new crops or new way of farming uh, or farming in a new area or something. And so if it, if it doesn't work out, it goes awry somehow, they won't go broke or lose their land. They'll still be able to have a sufficient living during the transition period. Or if they, if they want, they can go back and try their own way again. But uh, I like the idea of a safety net to encourage people to do things that are arguably good for the environment. Yes. Yeah. 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 So many ideas. Do you ever get um, well overwhelmed and uh, with just talk? 
Because I talk or no, <laughs> all the talking right now. Well, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. I mean, how can we present? Well, like I said, there, there's, there, there was good and bad that I heard there. And, um, uh, you know, the shepherd in particular said, well, you know, don't, don't just uh, rag on it, that it was awful. Uh, some people do. Um, and so they said, you know, finding that there's something positive. And so I tried to balance that shepherd article. And it seemed like a good guy for presentations in general. I mean, I could come here and trash the whole thing and say I wasted my money for my time going to that. But you know, what, what would be the uh, advantage of that? Um, but there is, let's see, I can give you a little bit of the other side that way. Um, there, here's an article from the Milwaukee Journal that appeared after the conference. African activists expressed anger at climate talks. And with good reason. Uh, some of them are maybe the ones who are at that Don't Drill Africa demonstration. Possibly. It says climate activists in Africa are expressing anger, anger toward the United Nations Climate Agency, accusing it of allowing corporations and individuals with dubious climate credentials to greenwash their polluting activities by participating in its annual climate conference. You know, the, a young woman, Britta Thunberg, uh, was not at this one, uh, but she had gone to the previous one in Glasgow and declared that it was a greenwashing festival. And, you know, there's some truth to that. <laughs> Then it, then it goes on. The criticism follows uh, Thursday's announcement that the oil, oil executive Sultan Al Jabbar will lead the next round of UN climate talks, which would be held in the United Arab Emirates, Emirates beginning in late November, uh, really mostly December, just coming December. Uh, Pan African Climate Justice Alliance termed the move as the lowest moment for the US agent, for the UN agency. The UN's climate body hasn't commented on the appointment. And so they go on and mention that uh, an analysis of the provisional list of the COP that I went to of their conference participants found that 636 people were linked to the fossil fuel companies, which was a 25% increase from the previous one in Glasgow. So, uh, so that bus is accelerating, partly due to these lobbyists who are accelerating their participation in these COP conferences. So, um, so I showed the loss and damage thing there. Um, yeah, like I said, that was the, the positive thing to come out, but it's more of a trajectory thing. It was like a step in the right direction. You can't really say that the poor countries suffering from climate change that they didn't cause, uh, they didn't get all that they want. Um, there have been a whole bunch of broken promises for the past several cops of something like 100 billion a year from the developed countries to be. Uh, gone to less developed countries to help them on various ways. Uh, it hasn't been met any particular year. And I don't know if it will be this year. We'll see. But um, uh, one can find disappointing things uh, without looking too hard at the conference and things that people had to say. Are you, you going to go to the next? The next. Well, one? yes. Um, uh, the um, I like two firsts in my travels. And going to Egypt for the conference and spending uh, a bit more than a week there, and then going to see the wonders of ancient Egypt and along the Nile, that was that was too good to pass up. So that was great. In the Emirates, um, I don't know that you'd have the two for it. does cost a bit of money to go to these things. And um, you know, if the national organization paid me for going there, I'd consider it. It was I enjoyed it, it was worthwhile. And, I can come back and share with people. It's even more of a worthwhile. So thanks for being a great audience. Are the conferences held every year? They had a pause for COVID. So when it says 27, it's not exactly the 27th year, but it is the 27th conference. Um, uh, the one that's maybe best known is the one in uh, Paris. It was in 2015, where they had set the goal of 1.5 degrees to keep the norming below that. That, uh, that limit, um, but they have they have almost a, just about every year. Over that the next one's in twenty twenty three. Well, the, the one this year is in December. It's in the article it starts in late November, but it's mostly December in Dubai. Anyone else? Thank you. All right.
Well, um, don't give up hope. No part of this thing is in your hands. Um, all, all, all past kind of change that's destroying the world probably depends, well, on places like the United States to do better. You know how much of a hassle it is to, uh, well, do renewable energy and things like that. Uh, Bernie Sanders once talked about a $6 billion, $6 trillion program to build back better green. And it got whittled down to the Inflation Reduction Act, which had a lot, um, but it was a total of only 1.2 trillion. And so uh, a lot a lot of opportunity was lost there that, that we could do better next time around if more public pressure was there. Thank you for your optimism and your very <laughs> The people that left went to church to serve us better. Oh, they weren't living.